Welcome to a new episode of Song Sessions. I'm your host, David Pomerantz, and today we have one of the most musically gifted people I know. She has written and recorded some of the most beautiful records in pop music history, winning Grammys, performing Oscar-nominated songs in some of the most beloved Hollywood films, writing and performing in stage musicals of her own, while working with Andrew Lloyd Webber and some of the most extraordinary artists in show business. To me, she's a friend uh, whom I admire. Her singing voice is at once sweet and angelic and yet passionate and bold at the same time. A fine wine with all of the notes intact. Her songwriting is beautifully crafted and always straight from the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my joy to spend some quality time today with the wonderful and extraordinary Melissa Manchester. Hello, Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm very, very, very well. How are you out there in LA? Good? Good, good. Thanks. Good. We've got these, we've got these Fakakta things in our ears here. You can take one out. Which I, oh, I'm going to take one out. How about that? Say hello. Oh, there, I can hear you fine. Okay. I, you know, do you use uh, earbuds when you perform, or do you like the monitors on the speaker? No, I, you know, I tried that once, and I just felt uh, too separated from the audience. I really need yeah. that, that ambient connection. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Boy, oh boy. Definitely. Well, good. All right. So, um... We'll just jump right in. I have, I, actually, I, I, this is a trick on you because we have, uh, Melissa has her piano there just to, to, I told her just to reference a few of her songs, but actually, it's a full concert. Take it, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> is this on? Is this on? <laughs> uh, I've just uh, left the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you are, uh, you were born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, yes? Yes, uh, well, partially in the Bronx and mostly in Manhattan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, good. Um, the when we're at your birthday. I was looking uh, some data on you, and your your birthday is February fifteenth. You're a fellow Aquarian. I'm also an Aquarian. I'm February 9th. and uh, so I just wanted you to know before we get started that I'm six days older than you are. <laughs> yes, and compatible. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and definitely compatible. But it's, it's really a bit uncanny, though, isn't it? I mean, you know other Aquarians, right, that are artists. It's interesting, right? There's th there are things in common. Yes, in Shakespeare's Tempest, I believe the line is that February makes its own rules. So I subscribe oh. to that. How interesting. Was, was Willie Shakespeare an Aquarian, I wonder? I have no idea. I wonder. I don't know. Uh -huh. Your dad uh, is a musician, was he a was, musician, yes. and, yes. and uh, he played uh, in the bassoon in the Metropolitan Opera House. Yes. And, um, and your mom was a designer, a clothing designer. So your, your house was filled with art of all kinds. Yes. What was it like? Can you tell me a bit about what it was, it was like being a, a young girl uh, in that house with all of this crazy artistry going on? Well, uh, I was really born in, into the perfect family. Uh, we had a very festive version of normal. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, my parents were both the black sheep of their family. Uh, my father was supposed to be an optometrist or something safe like that. And sure. he, he joined the high school band and the only instrument left was the bassoon. And so he said, I'll take it. And he became um, one of the great bassoonists in the world, actually. And uh, my mother was a pioneer in the fashion design and manufacturing uh, world. And so my sister and I were raised to uh, pursue our dreams. And because mm. the Upper West Side of Manhattan was so vibrant, uh, you, you could actually, you know, you were just tripping over adventures. And oh. uh, I was a, a product of the public school system. And then I went to the High School of Performing Arts. And as a teenager, I had all kinds of spectacular jobs. I was uh, I was an usherette at the Vivian Beaumont Theater at Lincoln Center when I was 16. Wow. Oh, I became wow. a staff writer at Chapel Music when I was 17. I studied songwriting with Paul Simon. I parked cars for a, a theater company on the east side. They didn't know I didn't know how to drive and I didn't bother telling them. Uh, I was a <laughs> gopher at the Children's Television Network. I mean, it was just like I did street theater. There was just lots to do in the right. city. Yeah. Wow. So, 
Yeah. Oh my God. So it, when you went to the High School of Performing Arts, you also, th did you learn piano there or was it before that? Oh no, I started taking piano lessons when I was five. And um, my father had a peculiar obsession with my sister and I taking piano lessons because, and he loved us practicing churny because he loved the two-handed playing. Uh, bassoonists hmm. only play one hand at a time. So the sound of two hands playing made him happy. <laughs> <laughs> what is Cher what is Cherny? What is that? Cher Cherny is uh, he's the the composer oh, that composer. created all of the scale exercises. Oh no, kidding! I didn't know that. Yeah, C Z E R N Y, Cherny. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and were you and are you uh, traditionally trained, classically trained? Can you read? Do you write your music out? No. Uh, well, I write my music out. Um, because it, it slows my brain down enough to help me remember the new groove I'm trying to create in my brain. Mm. I'm, I'm not really classically trained. I was a terrible student because my ear, uh, my ear was much quicker than my eye-hand coordination. And so I would improvise Chopin, you know, I would improvise Debussy, and you know, the, the teacher would say, excuse me, where are you on the page actually? And I said, I, I don't know. You but got this by <laughs> ear. You picked it up. You picked it up. Well, yes, because I because my my bait and switch was always to ask my piano teachers to play the the piece that they were just assigning to me a couple of oh times. <laughs> so I I got it in my head oh. and I just would start to make it up. Well, that's extraordinary. Well, you're sorry, but you're a genius. That's the way it goes. <laughs> Wait, well, you are. I mean, that's 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 extraordinary. Is what it is. See. So. Well, you, you know, I I I loved. I always loved music. Music was always playing in the house. Sounds always moved me, whether it was listening to Gershwin when I was nine or listening to the vacuum cleaner, that incredible hum that just sort of slowed my brain down. I'm uh. sure that, yeah, I'm sure that I could be diagnosed with all sorts of brain stuff these days. But as a kid, um, school was difficult for me because uh, I'm a slow learner, but what I realized was happening in my brain is that I was listening to the tone of my teacher's voices as opposed mm. to the substance. And so I oh. would have to catch up and get the substance secondary. But Interesting. In, in the end, it all worked out. Mm, fascinating. And so they would play Ber uh, Gershwin in the house. Did they bring in, what other, did they play more eclectic things as well? Is that where you oh, first yes. heard pop oh, music? Yes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. What'd you I hear? Yeah, I first heard Ella Fitzgerald when I was five. It was the uh, Ella Sings Gershwin album with uh, mm -hmm. Ellis Larkins playing piano, just the two of them. And it was so, wow. it was so singular, um, a plucking of my five-year-old heartstrings that I, I didn't know what she was singing about, but that mm -hmm. was the, she was the one that, that turned on the light for me. And I just wanted to follow her and, um, and get big so I could do what she was doing. Oh my but God. yes, but yes, there was uh, there was jazz. There was always classical music playing. My father was always practicing in the house for performances and mm -hmm. making his reeds for the piano for the bassoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a little bit of rock and roll, not too much, but there was always Broadway show music, always. Right. And in those days, Broadway show music was was largely the pop music on the radio. Right. Mm -hmm. All of that rich composition, yep. songwriting-wise, were those your uh, were those your heroes, those boys and girls? Yeah, yeah, it, you? you know, it, yes, it was it was mostly Rogers and Hammerstein and Rogers and Hart and Cole Porter, and Dorothy Fields, and then the Beatles showed up, and mm -hmm. the Be the Beatles were sort of that. You know, I consider myself part of a bridge generation. I guess you are too. I, I don't sure. know that much about your background, but for those of us who grew up with pop music coming mostly from the stages of Broadway, then the other side of the bridge was the singer, the introduction of the singer-songwriter, that second wave, not the first wave. The first wave I consider sort of the folk singers and writers of, yeah. of the four, 30s and 40s. Right. And the, and the singer-songwriters of the 60s and 70s, um, we were that bridge because we were introduced. I mean, if we were listening to pop music, we were listening to to Broadway show music 
that had become very popular. And then, you know, and then Laura Nero, and then Joni Mitchell, and then James Taylor, and then Stevie Wonder, and then mm -hmm. Sly Stone, and all of those people who were taking pop music and infusing it with a different uh, shape of lyric writing. And um, even though rhythm was taking over, still, still in all, if you took away the rhythm, you, could, you still had a substantial composition. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's mm -hmm. funny you should mention Laura Nero because I had listed uh, to discuss her with you. Um, yeah. Yeah, she was, she was really something. And she did do that. I know exactly what you mean in terms of, about a, of a bridge artist. I mean, she, her ear nodded like crazy to the classical songbook absolutely. Absolutely. and a uh, pop songbook. And yet uh, she was saying her own words in her own way. And, she uh, was. I mean, it, Laura was my muse when I was when I was 16 and, and uh, just starting to write. She was also an Upper West Side Manhattan girl. And I had mm. never I had never heard shafts of light uh, brought into lyrics. I'd never heard a voice used that way, stretched and commenting on her composition as she was singing. I just had never mm -hmm. heard, heard any of it. I'd never heard a woman uh, singing from such depth. And it was, uh, it was really startling to me. It's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I feel so much the same way. I got to actually tour with her. I, I opened a few of her shows. I did. You did? I did. So I got to hear wow. a lot of her things and wow. said hello meekly. Hi, and she was she was a little shy as well. So she was hi. <laughs> it wasn't a deep relationship, but she uh, she struck me that way. And I'd hear songs of hers. The the early album, there was a song on there produced by Herb Bernstein called "I Never Meant to Hurt You." Exactly. That? That song. Yeah. And uh, that that talk about a, a a bridge song or a crossover from yes a natural, you know I never meant to hurt you, not that way at all. Please. Right. Yeah. So so. Yeah. It's it, and and it's it's chills. It's chills. And then yeah. her next album, uh, which had Timer and Emily and all these yep. Stone Soul Picnic and things that became hits and such. But yeah, yeah she was. Uh, she, she was, was really something. And the, yeah, I was. Um, I had met her, and we had a, a little bit of a because I had moved to L.A. at the time, and we had a little bit of a phone phone friendship. And no, I remember no. one of the last times I spoke to her, I don't know what we were talking about, but, but the thing is, and you probably know this, is she spoke the way she wrote. Huh. And uh, I had heard from Charlie Colello, who had produced Eli and the 13th Confession, right. that you know when she was in the studio and there was a room full of string players, she would say, play purple. Yeah. And they'd all look, look at each other. But when, but when I spoke to her on the phone, she... she I don't recall what we were talking about, but but we were talking about women or something. And she said, "Women, women are red. Women are red." And I thought, "Women, women are red. What does that mean?" And anyway, the the discussion was over. And then a while later, quite a while later, I was working on a song called "Through the Eyes of Grace," and in the verse, I was moved to write about this character: "Women don't get older, just a deeper shade of red." Uh -huh. And th and that was from her coming through me in that way, you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. Uh, artists are artists to, to me. I, I as I speak with them through my whole life. If there's any kind of a depth of conversation, I usually find that either you're the painter, they write, or they other things, um, because expression is expression. And how about you? Do you do you uh, do you paint and do you or do you uh, do you write <laughs> books or? I know you write shows. We're going to talk about that, which is so exciting. I, but I, I write choral pieces. <laughs> oh, it yes, you do. Laugh. I've heard. Go ahead. I yeah. do. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I write choral pieces. Um, I, I wrote a composed one called Awake, which we did a video of, and it was posted at the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm proofreading uh, the second piece that I've finished, uh, almost finished, and mm -hmm. um, I believe I'm going to write a third one to complete the suite of, of these pieces mm -hmm. where, the, where the words were inspired by um, Rabindranath Tagore, who was an Indian poet and playwright and Nobel winner 
for literature. And um, his writing, I discovered when I was 17. And I, mm. I was so moved by it. And I would hear, I would, when I would read his work, I would hear something, but it had not distilled into something I could play to you or for mm -hmm. you or, or, or back. And finally, several years ago, uh, one morning I woke up and I read the same segment that I've been reading for decades and I started to hear it and I stopped everything and I just kept singing what I was hearing. I didn't even want to put my hands on the piano to disturb what I was hearing. And so I just started writing out what I was hearing and then I started to find the harmonic accompaniment and it, it wrote itself in about a month, but mm -hmm. I'd never I'd never written SATB plus piano parts out. So it was, you know, it was a slow but steady process because once I started to hear it, then I would hear the next four bars and then I would hear the next four bars. And so it's um it's it's very interesting to do that. And yes, I do have a book in me. I have not I have not sat down to write it yet but <laughs> okay I'm, sh I'm sure it would be very excellent if you did i'm sure i think you would but you know what i've heard a i've heard awake um oh. i want to i want to dive into other things but i must tell you and tell the people that are listening um this is an extraordinary piece and an extraordinary side of melissa manchester it's a it's a beautiful uh, choral piece and as you say, the, the sentiment, the, the, the communication is true. And, true. and basically, this, this man is, is, is talking about wake up to life, wake up to freedom, wake up to responsibility, whack, whack, whack. It's up to us guys, bang, you know. And, it, yeah. and your music is, is really punctuates and, and gives emotional weight to that communication. It's beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you. You know, he didn't write it about our nation. He didn't write it, you know, in this century. He wrote it a very long right. time ago. But that it, but that it is the universality of it is applicable to every place. And I just, uh, and so resonant. And um, so it's been. Yeah. It's, it's been the truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lo lovely, lovely. So uh, you you said something very quickly before. I said, well, yeah, and I studied with Paul Simon and that. that, that. So, whoa, whoa, er, let's roll back the tape. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how did that happen? Uh, was that at NYU? Where, where did you do that? Yes, I went to NYU School of the Arts for one year and then realized that I was done with school. So I went back to work as a jingle singer. But my two friends huh. that I had met at NYU signed my name up for a course. And in those days, you know, this is long before electronics and social media, there was a scrap of paper on the bulletin board in the hallway and it said songwriting and record production taught by Paul Simon mm. and uh, and I was 17 at the time and uh, nobody was sure if it was Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel because Bridge Over Troubled Waters was number one all over the world in that moment so we couldn't figure out what he would be doing on East 7th Street but indeed it was and he auditioned everybody himself personally oh. and and um, I <laughs> and in that moment, I was listening to a lot of Laura Nero. So he brought me into the studio and he said, OK, play something. And I played something. He said, play, play another song. I said, OK. And I played another song. He said, play me one more song. And I played him one more song. And he said, have you been listening to Laura Nero? I said, oh. yes, all the time. She's my muse. I live and breathe her. He said, and it's time to stop. And that was really interesting. And then and he taught for six months, it was a fantastic class made up of all different kinds of, of young singer-songwriters. And um, he taught very simply, and he taught from his truth, which is all stories have been told. It is the way you tell your story that is your stamp of authenticity. And in those days, uh, songwriters were actually making up language. The Beatles made up Obla Di, Obla Da, Life Goes On. Yeah. Laura, Laura had made up Can You Surrey, Can You Picnic, all that stuff. And so, so the idea of finding your authenticity through the original, your original originality in terms of use of language, use of metaphor, Mm -hmm. use of making up language was really, uh, really fantastic. And 
what the assignments were in the class was to come in with an idea, everybody, each week, whether it was a title, a verse, a song, including him. And he would talk about what he was, what he was doing in order to get to the center of his song idea. He talked about Bridge Over Troubled Waters, by the way, oh. and, and composing it. He said, yeah, we knew that, uh, that it needed a bridge, and I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything. He said, and then I remembered, you know, Sail on Silver Girl. That's the bridge. Sail on yeah. Silver Girl. He said, Sail on Silver Girl was about an old girlfriend who had gone prematurely gray. It had nothing to do with the song. I just liked the way it sounded. And uh -huh. I'll be damned. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yum, yum. So, yeah, so it, it was really, you know, it was really great and informative and very much what I teach students when I'm giving classes uh, or, or individual sessions. Yeah, because it's true. Incredible. That's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Extraordinary. Well, your, your work is so diverse and uh, you, mm -hmm. well, I can see that you would have jumped from that because those times were pop, pop times. And you're a great, I'm going to say a few things about you. I mean, from my viewpoint, you're a great pop girl. I mean, you're great. <laughs> you're great. Now that I know so much more about you as a composer and a, and, and a singer, uh, we're going to talk about that later. But those uh, songs that you wrote uh, on your own with Carol Bear Sager or whomever else um, are beautifully, beautifully constructed things. And they're always melodic and lovely. And uh, the, first, the first album that you did, uh, Home to Myself, um, I was listening to it the other day and uh, listening to a, a tune on there that Carol, that Carol Bear Sager wrote um, called, um, what was it, uh, If It Feels Good, Let It Ride? Mm -hmm. that one? Mm -hmm. And what struck me, it's a great song. Um, I'd heard her do it before, but I hadn't heard your version of it. And that was your first album. And I could tell that you were a real artist, like you were the real deal. Mm -hmm. When I heard that, I thought, because it's 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 a cappella, it's it's there's mouth movements, there's it's it's completely invented, and it and it's exciting. I could tell right then that that's where you live. You mm -hmm. are a creator. When people uh, say something about me, sometimes where they say, "Well, what are you?" You you know you you write the beautiful songs, you sing rock and roll, you write for the theater, da da da. You got to be one of those things. No. That the marketing thing, right? And yes, you, well, yes. Did you, were you confronted with that? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as a gal, they really, they keep narrowing it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the right. thing is that, that I have learned is that the, the deeper I get into the journey, the urge to create doesn't know age. It doesn't know the idea of slowing down. It's just the urge to create, you know, it's the spirit speaking and um, and, you know, we're in such an interesting time being um, being able to be independent artists. I am anyway, mm -hmm. and having experienced crowdfunding through uh, learning about that through my students. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just been really it, it though, though being an independent artist is sort of code word for you do four times the amount of things yourself. Uh, the the tr what it what it liberates me to do is create music exactly as I hear it, to bring mm -hmm. in collaborations where there's no discussion. I just say, does anybody know Al Jarreau? Okay, let's find him. You know, or uh, that kind of stuff. And so, so uh, yes, I'm a creator. I get yes. when, when when an idea gloms onto me and insists on being expressed, then that is what I will be doing. Period. Period, because you say so. Yeah, you bet. When when you, I totally get it. Did you something? Did you something more you wanted to say? I didn't want to. No, you no, know, but no, no, no. But but to your point of being categorized, of course, in the seventies, boy, they wanted they wanted gals to be, you know, either, I don't know, you know, the next Madonna or whatever. And honestly, none of that was terribly interesting to me because. Um, because it was always about being current, and I was never terribly interested in being current. Um, I was much more interested in being timeless, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I was going to say, 
boy, yes. You know, and that's natural to, for you when you wrote mm -hmm. Midnight Blue, when you wrote uh, Just You and I, mm -hmm. these gorgeous, gorgeous things. Can you, we, we have, uh, Melissa has agreed to have her piano nearby. Um, <laughs> One of, the, one of the reasons I like to do this show, and it inspired me to do this show, is uh, I want to keep culture here. Mm -hmm. And it's not any highfalutin idea. It's just a little bit like what you shared before. You know, there are people who are gorgeously, geniusly amazing, and, if, and they can't not be here. And so I want everyone to know. We've done uh, Barry Mann, we've done uh, Alan Bergman, we've done, uh, you know, others. And, and that's, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a mission, really, oh, um, sure. to keep great art here. Thank um, you for that. So, you bet. You <laughs> bet. So, when you, when you, so would you just play, a, play just a, a tiny bit of uh, Midnight Blue? Sure. Just so um, the listeners can remember, and those who don't know it, the real young, young, young guys, you've got to know these songs. Okay. Please. Whatever it is, it'll keep till the morning. Haven't we both got better things to do? Midnight blue. Even the simple things become rough. Haven't we had enough? I think we can make it one more time if we try if we try one more time for all the old times for all of the times you told me you need me Needing me now is something I could use. Midnight blue. Wouldn't you give your hand to a friend? Maybe it's not the end. And I think we can make it. If we try, if we try one more time for all the old times, midnight blue. Oh man, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. What, what a <laughs> what a great what a great gift and what an honor, what a joy. These three, these words are thrown around, but it's a joy and an honor to hear you do that. I Thanks. must tell you. Thank you. Um, so much. Yes, you bet. Um, when you, well, before you had that hit, you met up with Clive, as did I in the '70s. Um, and I wanted to ask you. Well, first of all, he heard you what in cl in a club, or did he or did he hear you as one of the Harlets, or how, how did you? <laughs> I no, 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 no. Actually, well, years before Clive um, established Arista, I actually had auditioned for him at Columbia and he passed. Um, uh, but I, yes, but I was signed to Sweet Larry Utah, signed me to Bell Records. Oh, Bell, yeah, yeah. And I made the first two albums on Bell as an album artist. Um, and then Clive came in and absorbed Bell into Arista. So myself and Barry Manilow and Tony Orlando and Don were the three acts that created the, the cornerstone of uh, Arista. Wow, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, your, your album, we, we, you were uh, produced by uh, Vinnie Poncia. Yes. Who, who, uh, and when I remember her, hearing your album in Midnight Blue and those beautifully th produced things, I also uh, uh, asked him to do my album there at that same time, yes. and you and, and I, you sang, and on, sang you sang on it. You did. <laughs> I sure did. You sang on trying to get the feeling again. I sure did. It, it was so beautiful. I've been all... up. You went up, up. down, uh -huh. down. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, you right. Did. Yep. Those were those were interesting uh, interesting days. The the pressure to come up with hits though 
you, you did an interesting thing because you, you, you wrote a very, very nice line because your songs were always quality, uh, always heartfelt. And that's the thing about Clive, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to ask you more about Clive. He's an interesting man. But uh, he also had that thing where he, heard, he would hear something and his eyes would tear up and he'd smile and he'd go, that. You know, that was my experience with him. But he, he, did he um, try to get you to write hits after Midnight Blue, is like, okay, we're on, now we're on the map. Well, Give you me know, more uh, of those. Yeah, as you know, the only thing harder than the first hit is the second hit. Mm -hmm. And so after Midnight Blue came out, and I, I worked like a dog to promote it. I did, you know, coast to coast uh, radio tours and secondary markets and college radio uh, markets and all that. Um, yeah. Yeah, our Carol and I wrote a song called Better Days, which was really a follow-up to Mid Midnight Blue. And it, it charted, but it didn't chart as well. And so as I got deeper into the Arista world, um, electronics was starting to show up in terms of production tools. Mm. And so my experience was fraught with, um, with concern because I lost my way. You know, disco was starting to happen. And though I had had, you, you know, a pretty enormous success with Through the Eyes of Love, written by Marvin Hamlish and Carol Sager, and, um, and sang on the Academy Awards and all that, as a recording artist, I was losing my place because personally I had not much interest in disco and really no interest in electronic sounds. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, they really bristled against my soul. That just was not my nature. I'm an acoustic mm -hmm. gal, uh, my world, you know. It, so, so I would have to um, find something in the composition that would justify my voice. And what ended up happening, unfortunately, is that I was sort of competing with myself to find space on my own albums because they mm. were, yeah, because Clive and the guys were trying to find a place for me and less, less and less I was, you know, comfortable with what I was being offered. Uh, you know, some of it was great. You should hear I Should Talks About You was great because it was great. solid. And I yeah. absolutely had a chance to work with the genius Arif Mardin. My friends, Dean Pitchford and Tom Snow, wrote it. Um, you know, it was great fun to put it together uh, because Arif was so spectacularly talented as a musician. I felt really safe with him. He was not the new kid on the block. He understood where you should hear fit into the spectrum of music. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I and do. so and so I thought, OK, I can I can I can do this. I can find my way into this. And plus, it was so, so well constructed. But um, but funnily enough, I made an album called Mathematics, which is which is uh, my students love this album because it's very electronic. It's very poppy. And I, I didn't listen to it for a long time. And then I did because it was reissued as part of a set of uh, all my albums. And, and the truth was, once again, if I could find the, the structure of the basic composition, forget about the sound of it, if the actual structure of the composition was OK, you know, then, I, then it was OK to me. But I did not spend time in the studio while I was recording that album because I didn't know what the producers were listening to. The sounds were so, they were so, uh, they were so icy. They were not mm -hmm. warm. So you come so, in and you, you know, just you deliver your, your vocal. I did. I did. I, did. I, I, I placed myself as the girl singer. And, mm. um, and I did, you know, I sang fine, as I do. Uh, and it was an assignment, but I was not, you know. So anyway, that's, I understand. you know, yeah. Thank you. I do, I do understand. But, or, but around that and in spite of that, you... Uh, wrote uh, my favorite Melissa song, uh, which is Coming From the Rain. Oh, yeah. Thanks. And uh, by the way you said, oh, yeah, you, do you agree? Did, I mean, is it one of I your favorites as well? Yes. 
it is one of my favorites. It's um it it's it's very uh it's very meaningful for a lot of people. I'm very grateful that so many artists recorded it. I'm grateful, as I'm sure you are, that it has lasted. Um, there, you know that that's that's not nothing, as my late mother used to say. <laughs> no, it's not nothing. It 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 uh, it is it is in the genre of the the. The universe of, of, to me, of George Gershwin and Richard Thank Rogers, and you. It, you, you made, you made it. You, you made it. You know, we all, Thank we all try, and then every once in a while, you go, you get the ring, you know, bang, and you got it. Uh, um, thank you. I, I just love it, um, and uh, Car Carol's, Carol Sager's lyric is gorgeous on that. Yes. And your composition. Um, I just want to gush one more second about that song. Um, I'm, I'm going to sing it back. The melody. Uh, Da 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 la da dee dee doo doo ba da doo doo ba da da la da dee da 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 diminished chord crazy la da 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 come the rain coming from the rain and then on the bridge you do this crazy thing I sat at the piano yesterday and you were and it looks like I got a B flat major seven that. Sunny skies, G diminished C sharp bass. -ish. Well, it's an actual. Could you? It's it's could, a, actually an E flat. Could you please to, uh, play the bridge section, this beautiful uh, thing? Yeah. E flat. Sunny skies. Now that I know you're all right. Time has left us older and wiser. I know I am. Yeah. Play, <laughs> play the verse and chorus quickly. I, this sure. is too great. Are you kidding? Because well, I'll kick hello. myself. Go ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> Go ahead. hello there. Uh, hello there. Good old friend of mine. You've been reaching for yourself for such a long time. There's so much to say. No need to explain, just an open door for you to come in from the rain. It's a long road when you're all alone, and someone like you will always choose the long way home. There's no right or wrong, I'm not here to blame, oh. I just want to be the one to keep you from the rain, from the rain. And then we're back to the bridge. And then, and then it looks like... Yeah, I have to tell you a funny story about that bridge. Is yes, Carol and I, we wrote the two verses and finished them. And then I went back to my apartment. And um, in those days, uh, I had a drummer who lived with me. And the reason he lived with me is uh, to ensure that he would make it, make it to gigs on time. He was very talented, but he was chronically late. So my husband at, at the time and I had him live in the room, asleep in the room where I kept my upper my upright piano. Oh my God. So I came, I, yeah. So I came home from Carol's uh, place, and I could feel a bridge coming through. And and it was late at night, and I climbed over my drummer. <laughs> to get to the piano <laughs> and I wrote and it looks like sunny skies now that I know you're all right time has left us older and wiser and I you know I had the damper on the piano so I, I could play it quietly and then the next day I called Carol I said I have the bridge and I went over to her place and I played it for her and it looks like sunny skies now that I know we're all right time has left us older but wiser and she said that's perfect but let me add I know I am oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. And was that guy on time or what? <laughs> did, did he make it after that? <laughs> <laughs> Who cares at that point? <laughs> Forget about that guy. Yeah. Oh, that's too amazing. That's just yeah. amazing. I uh, want to ask you also, uh, I hope you don't mind me asking you questions that I've always wanted to ask of you. Sure, uh, I, sure. I didn't want this to be just the regular one. Then, in 1987, I... You know, yes, exactly. But when you, but when you do, did those two songs on, uh, on the Oscars, 
Yes. Um, I saw that uh, that evening. And I want to comment on something. First of all, those, as you mentioned, they're beyond gorgeous, both of those songs. Uh, they are got, indeed. Uh, yeah. We've got, um, let's see, what were they? Where am I? Through, through uh, the Eyes of Love. Oh, yeah. And yeah, Through the Eyes of Love. Goodbye. And Never Say Goodbye. Uh, never Say Goodbye by our friend uh, David Shire and, and the Bergmans, our yes. friends. Uh, David is an extraordinary uh, composer, and uh, uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful song. And then what I wanted to tell you is that uh, Through the Eyes of Love, which is equally beautiful in a different way mm -hmm. by Hamlish and, and Sager, um, I feel that that's one of your greatest, on the record, one of your greatest performances. Thank you. Um, it's, it's so true. It's, uh, it's what I said in the very beginning about all the notes. Uh, you really uh, caress that melody, and you really mean it. And and uh, I was and I was struck by uh, how how accomplished that performance is. I know all you were trying to do is make it good, <laughs> but <laughs> it's received. I received and went there. It is. That's but how the, it goes. Yeah, but the thing is, and, and and it is. It's something I try to explain to students. You know, I was given this composition to learn by Marvin and Carol. And, it, you know, I don't know, maybe it was a Thursday afternoon and they called, they said, can you come down and sing this for this movie? And I said, sure, because we were all friends. And listening to it, it was so stunning and so beautiful and appropriate for the movie it was, it was capturing. Um, that all I had to do was show up and do my very best because every note and every word was just as lovely as could be. That's right. Uh, yeah, and, and also because I was, I was raised from the time I was little in, in the world of great singers singing great songs yeah. without, without too much vocal gymnastics or embellishments right. because the composition itself was so solid. Right. You, di you didn't want to, create distance between you and the composition through showing off. Yeah, you, you know, don't want to upstage that thing. That's exactly, so true. exactly. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not talking about Ella scatting. It's not that, because that's tour de force stuff in a whole other world. It's right. about serving the, the quote unquote playwright, the lyricist and the composer and their beautiful song. It was just, it was an honor to, to record that and uh, yeah. Certainly, an honor to sing both those songs. Mm -hmm. Yum yum. Yeah, it's it's yummy, and it makes it all worthwhile. Uh, what what was your take on Judy Garland? Oh, well, Ella Fitzgerald and Judy Garland were my two musical godmothers. They, you know, they didn't know it. I'm just telling you. Um, sure. Judy was um, nobody. Nobody that I was aware of dug deeper to to bring you her side of the conversation, the vehicle being the song. She was so invested in the, the inner life of those performances. It was just, it was just thrilling. I mean, that, that Judy Garland at, at Carnegie Hall, it's just, you know, it's just landmark, it's standard, it's, it's perfection. Uh, yeah. on so many levels and um, I'm sorry I never get got to meet her but uh, I do know Liza and Lorna her children um, so yes I she she is she's the go-to in terms of how to how to sing something and mm -hmm. Ella is my other go-to in how to sing something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ella has a, has a perpetually even when she sings uh, ballads she's has a smile she she delivers a smile. She twinkles, Ella. She does. Uh, and and uh, and Judy, uh, what you've said is you've said it so beautifully. When when I s uh, see the Star Is Born, the the re the refurbished Star Is Born, and I see things in there, and those are all live vocals. Yes. How about that? I watched that? really closely. There were none. You know, you could actually hear the the uh, the echo in the studio. You hear the echo in the room. Yep. When she's singing uh, the man that got away, you know, she's singing that song, and uh, and it's and of, uh, it's and, it's of, chill. and of course, yeah, and of course, Harold Arlen gave her everything to sing, well, you know. Yeah. So. Yes. 
Good, good. All right, my friend, let's see. What do we have here? I'm going to go through, because you've already told so many things that I was going to ask you. <laughs> when you oh, see, so, uh, good night, everybody. <laughs> no, this That's is perfect. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> this is perfect. This is, this is how it should be. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see what I want to talk to. Oh, when you d wrote uh, with Kenny Loggins, Whenever I Call Your Friend. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a delightful song. I think that's a good, a good word for it, don't you think? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's got it delight is. in it. It is. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And his, and his how, production, his production how, was great. It's true. True. And how did you, uh, how, how did the single ever get to Stevie Nicks? What happened? What, what was that about? Uh, how did it get to Stevie Nicks? You know, yeah. I, I just, I think, I don't know. I, I presume that she was way cooler than me. Um, <laughs> And that Kenny had his eye on her all along as a good match for his voice. Uh, oh. It's funny because I had a chance to do a, a benefit with her many years later. And I went up to her and thanked her for her performance on Whenever I Call You Friend. And I said, uh, do you do you perform it live? She said, oh, no, it's much too hard for me to sing. It was hard for me in the studio. <laughs> to myself really huh? oh. Oh so my. yeah yeah mm. but you well, cut it you with know, him later i mean you you did cut it with I, him with I, kenny i i didn't no i didn't cut it with kenny no, no. i'm i've been, no i've been trying to cut it with kenny for decades and oh. he he really doesn't he hears a very mellow version uh, years and years ago alison krauss the the great alison krauss recorded sure. the song in a beautiful way very mellow very interesting chord changes Mm -hmm. And and it was great for her, but it's just not what I do on stage with this song. And mm. I, I still want it kind of bright because the audience responds to it. And Kenny's just not into that. He's just not into it. And so I'm I'm going, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to redo it and, and all of that. But what was interesting is that the opening vocalese that on his record yeah. it was it was it was a tribute to Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. Oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, I guess Phil Ramone produced that thing. I remember. Yeah. That was yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. Boy, oh boy. You did the tribute album. We've already talked about Ella and Judy and all that uh, in 89. And, uh, and you did this awesome version of Walk On By. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank really you. awesome. And, and very, very unique and very, uh, a, a nod to Dionne Warwick, but not Dionne Warwick. Definitely Melissa. Right. All the way. Well, yeah, well, one of the things that I had learned, I guess, from from Judy and from Barbara Streisand is when you when you take a a song that can stand being slowed down, mm -hmm. you you open up an inner life that is deep. And walk on by, you know, all of Dion's Backrock David songs, they were so fantastic, but they were very bright and peppy because it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was in the sixties. And I'd, I'd always thought that Walk On By was such a foreboding, mm. ominous kind of warning. I'm not sure, but a kind, of, kind of a warning. And I thought if I could slow it down and if I could get, you know, a producer to hear what I'm hearing, then all kinds of stuff could come through. And when it came time to make the video for it, you know, management and record company wanted to make a boy, girl, blah, blah, blah kind of a video. I said, no, I don't think so. I think we should do this at a homeless shelter with a mother having to leave her daughters and that she walks away because she can't take care of them. And they went, whoa, what? And we, we actually, yeah, and we actually we actually uh, shot it at, at Bethel Lutheran uh, Shelter for women and oh. their children. Oh, so you did and do that. Oh, my God. We did, yes, yes. Wow. And, we, and we used, we used um, physically challenged people, actors from from the Access Theater up in Santa Barbara that no longer oh. exists. But it was it was incredible. And it was so it was so meaningful. It was so true to the this new inner world of the song. It's beautiful. Extraordinary. What a great idea. What a great <laughs> idea. Talk about adding 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 meaning to the to uh, to all yes. of Yes. Well, bringing, I think bringing. songs, you know, the thing is that that depending on the arrangement of the song, the, the inner life of a song reveals that i mean when you think of when streisand slowed down happy days are here again yeah if they ever had ever if she had ever done a video of what that meant to her 
it would have been stunning because in those days, this is long before videos, sure. you know, just the performance of it was so, it was so disarming because this was a peppy, you know, 1930s song and she was slowing it down and the great late Peter Matz was doing this sublime uh, arrangement and yeah. and that's the thing. It uncovered, it revealed this inner something which was so spectacular. So I've always taken a cue from that. Oh, it's beautiful. Spectacular and a little sad too. That's that's kind of how it came. It's happy days are here again, that's not. Right. That's right. <laughs> not. That's and right. fill in the blanks why. Well, my, 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 my love left me. But, uh, yeah. There it is. That, but that's the magic of songs and songwriting and singing because as a songwriter, as you know, you are creating a world that did not exist before you wrote it. Mm -hmm. and, if you're, and if you're writing it for theater or if you're writing it for a movie, that song would absolutely have never existed because A, you're giving voice to a character at a mm -hmm. peak moment in search of something, uh, you know, or, or you're trying to capture the world of a film in, you know, in a, an opening or closing song. So it's really, it's really interesting. Fascinating. And when you write for film, uh, and of course theater, that's a whole other ball of wax, as they say, yeah? I mean, that's a whole it is, other yeah. idea. Yeah, it is. When I wrote I mean, for, Di for Disney, yeah, I had written a, a song for the great mouse detective. Disney was going through a, a peculiar period for several years where they stopped putting in any songs in their animated features. And I thought, really? Uh, <laughs> and so the great mouse detective reintroduced the idea of a song for a character. And, um, and I, was given, I was given just the sketches of a standalone song of this little animated mouse who's in a dance hall. <laughs> and, uh, and I was the third composer up, I was the third songwriter to try this. And uh, so I, <laughs> I spoke to the, the music director, the music supervisor. I said, well, this is Disney. You don't want, you know, let me entertain you. It's family fair. He said, oh, absolutely not. So I wrote the song and I submitted it. And they said, we, we really like what you're doing. And I, and I was listening to him and I was sort of listening to the spaces between his words. And I said, do you want me to write let me entertain you for family fair? He said, Yes, please. <laughs> so oh, I no. did. So I did. And and then, you know, and then when I wrote for uh, Lady and the Tramp 2 with Norman Gimbel, I mean, that was a score. That was writing for little doggy characters and having actors come in and play the parts. And, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're spotting songs in scenes and musicalizing scenes, just like the theater. And, right. um, yeah, the thing about writing for theater, as you know, is that you are creating a singular voice for the character that will not sound like anybody else. Yeah. And uh, to help to help the audience identify whose whose motif that is, you know. So mm. I love it. I love it. Very true. Well, you're very good at it. Very good at it. When when you uh, wrote uh, a piece of theater that you wrote, which I I gobbled up the other day, um, it's a it's a play a musical musical that you wrote with uh, Jeffrey Sweet. It's called I Sent a Lady to a Letter <laughs> Sent a Lady. Hello. I sent a letter to my love. Yeah. Uh, and um, oh, I hate this thing. I hate this. I thing. know. Let's let's un un uninvent oh, your buzz. Can we un can we un burden ourselves? I wish we could. I, I don't know. It's maybe it's going to e echo or okay. Schmecko. I don't care. But anyway, it, you know, it, it was a it's a very adventurous score Thanks. that you wrote there, um, Melissa. Uh, and what's interesting about that, if I may, uh, there's some wonderful songs in there. Um, you know, you go into Sondheim land and, and uh, atonal craziness, mm -hmm. and, and yet there's always uh, a Bernsteinian bass. You come back, you always use what's in your heart, I feel, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to temper it and to make it work so that it's not flying all over the place. I'm not saying mm -hmm. Son Sondheim flies all over the place. He doesn't generally. Actually, he's got his own ground that he mm -hmm. that he's so genius at. But you had had this kind of interesting combination. I just I, I observed and uh, and it's it's beautiful. Um, you did this piece uh, with um, Megan Mullally, yeah. 
Yes, and yourself. Megan, yes, mm -hmm, yes. It was it was great fun, and uh, we it went it ran off Broadway and it ran at the North Shore Theater, and then the more recent one, the Sweet Potato Queens, um, has uh, I wrote with Rupert Holmes and Sharon Vaughn. And, oh great! Uh, yeah, and that had its premiere at Tuts in Houston, um, and then a couple of years ago at. Um, new stages in Jackson, Mississippi, where it actually takes place. We were actually Good. supposed to get two productions this year, but because of, or last year, but because of COVID, yeah, it was postponed. Yeah, oi. Yeah. Fun to work with Rupert, was it? Yes. Oh, he's, Isn't he he's, funny? So, he's so stunning, and he's so brilliant. He's, he's stunning. so brilliant. stunningly brilliant. Um, yes. I had a wonderful, wonderful time working with him. I mean, I to see him work up close was uh, was just incredible we had to, if we have time for one brief story Please. we 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 went back to theater under the stars tuts after we had done a reading of sweet potato queens and then they, and they did a video of it so we could look at it and so we flew back to houston to to look at it so we met with the director on monday and we were going to have a table reading on friday so on monday we're looking at this video of the prior reading and the, after it's over, the director says, you know, Rupert, we were thinking, because the audience seems to have a hard time following your main character, we were wondering if we could split the main character into an older and a younger Jill, if that's her name. And so the older Jill will be sort of the narrator of the piece, and the younger Jill will be in the scenes. Uh, he's, and the director said, we just need, if you could just do a scene, that would be great, and then we'll have something for the actors to read on Friday. And Rupert said the following, do not bother me until I come back. And he stayed in his room. He would not let the housekeeper in. He only took room service and he deconstructed and reconstructed the entire script so that the, that the main character would now be split with two, two actors. And by Friday, we had a full script to read. And I thought, okay, this Boy. is a wizard. This is a wizard. So. Wow. How many days did it take him to do that? It took him two and a half, and he didn't sleep. Two and a half days. Yeah, he's, he's, he's tremendous. He's a genius, and he's so funny, and he's so warm. He's such a lovely man, isn't he? He is. He is. He's a is. good guy. He's very dear. Very yes, dear. He yes, yeah, he is. Yeah. Very dear. Good, good. Uh, can you tell me a bit about your, um, your touring in the Andrew Lloyd Webber plays? Now, as an actress, you, I, listen, people may m most know this, but maybe some don't and they know you exclusively as a singer and a songwriter, this woman is a great actress. So uh, you now, now you're, you because you've done TV and you've done uh -huh, films yeah. for, the, you're yeah. in for the boys with Bette and all that. Yeah. And so uh, tell me about Andrew Lloyd Webber and that experience, please. Um, Richard Maltby, wonderful director Richard Maltby, had uh, approached me about replacing Bernadette Peters uh, in Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical Song and Dance for the national tour. Right. And um, I had never done theater before. And the thing about song and dance is I'm the only one on stage for act one. And so I had, it was very rigorous. Uh, it was, of course, eight shows a week, a new town huh. every week because I was the star. Um, I had to do all the press. And I had a nine-month-old baby traveling with me and my late parents and his dad. So it was very rigorous, and it was um, it was it was informative in that I really got a chance to understand my deep reservoirs of spirit and strength, uh, because it was such hard work, and I'd never done this before, mm. and it and it was relentless. Um, and at the end of it, you know, people said we, you know, we want you back in the theater, blah, 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 blah. But I said, I, uh, this I cannot do. Oh, wow. um, but I've had, you know, other opportunities. Um, I had the great opportunity to sing Beggar Woman from Sweeney Todd at the 25th anniversary of Sweeney Todd at the Amundsen here. Oh, and, Ms. Great. And, and Mr. Sondheim came and it was just, it was just spectacular. Yeah. yeah. How wonderful. Yeah. When you first started out uh, and you played in the New York clubs, I want to, no, because that was the scene I was very in, involved in. And uh, wh where did you play, and what uh, what did you learn there, and what was that like for you, that scene back in the? Uh, it, when I first started performing, 
I was playing not only the coffee houses of Manhattan, but I was mostly playing in the college coffee houses in New York State, Delaware, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Right. And I I really <laughs> learned I really learned um, the the recommitment of what I am doing against all odds because in mm. those days. I was usually playing on any piece of crap upright piano that they had left out in the rain. And yeah. so with my back to the audience. So that was that was something. But I And there were there were there were school there were school auditoriums too. I mean there were they yeah. were literally uh yes. lunch lunch rooms. Yes, you're right. And if you played during yeah. lunchtime there was a nice big bell when classes had to resume <laughs> in the middle of your heartfelt ballad. Uh, but but when I first played uh, in the clubs in Manhattan, I played at Gertie's Folk City, oh, sure. which was a very famous club, and Mike mm. Porco was the owner, and you had to do three sets on the weekend, and frequently mm. that 2 a.m. set was done to a drunk at the bar. Mm. Uh, I frequently had more people on stage than in the room, but my sweet parents, my dad would come from the opera, you know, because he would play at night, he would go back uptown, get my mother out of her pajamas, they would both come down to the village to watch me yelling, bravo, baby, bravo. <laughs> but I played it, uh, I played there at Gertie's Folk City, I played at a club called The Focus on West 74th Street, and mm -hmm. uh, across the street from The Focus, diagonally across the street, was where Barry Manilow played for Bette Midler, and that's where he brought her to that's where he brought her, her from there to the focus to meet me to see you and, ah, yeah, i see yeah, and you had been know. friends with barry before you, you we were jingle before. singers we, yeah we were oh, jingle singers that's how we knew each other yeah crazy mm -hmm. Still and when you went on when you went out uh, so you became uh, one of the harlots with with bet midler I on the road the yeah yeah what? yeah you i did? created the harlots with with uh, barry and i was the toots in the middle for about six months and I went on the road and I, you know, it was still sort of at the beginning of her ascension and I saw what she did and how she transported an audience and, and you know, gave a voice to the gay audience and, and tr it was just transformative what she did. It was so disarming, it was so beautiful. And because, of course, she had Barry to help her manifest these incredible ideas it was, it was spectacular to watch her be her from behind how interesting melissa because uh, her, that communication ability that she has um you have and it's Thank interesting you. that 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 would have that would have uh, not only inspired but certainly uh, influenced what you did oh screw that uh, well, the thing and, is, uh, the, the the thing is that you can you can tell when somebody has it, whether they are aware of it or not, whether yes. we have the same background, you know, whether they listen to Judy, and Edith and Rosie and all of those people, or if they didn't. It's just right. it's just that commitment to serving that song um, from your point of view, and right. Uh, yeah, and right there, then that moment. Yeah. In that Never been done before. As if, that's right. That requisite, that requisite. That's, right. that's, that's so right. important. Yeah. And that's the thing, I guess, that would keep you or me or anybody sort of uh, in, in the game because there is nothing but present time. Well, and that's right. And well, the thing is also, you simply get better at doing it. It becomes, it becomes more interesting because sure. I, I'm, a, I'm, a more whole person, a more evolved person than when I wrote Midnight Blue, you know, 40 years ago. I, sure. the, these songs, such privileges, whether I wrote them or not, they are privileges because they have become these living monologues that I can invest more with my life's experience. It's just, it's remarkable. I did not see that coming in the beginning, mm. but that's what happens. Mm. That's fascinating. Did, did you know Chick Corea? Did you ever meet him? I did, and we wrote a song, and I'm going to be recording it on this album. Yeah. Oh, I Melissa. I did. What? A, yes. And talk about. Well, we know. Oh no, he's beyond genius, and he's also beyond. an extraordinary guy. We were very close friends. Uh, and uh, but he, but uh, I want to tell you something briefly about him, uh, and it has to do with present time. And I've never seen this before. And uh, I saw him 
two months ago to a little concert before he passed. And uh, he had uh, called a member of the audience up on the stage and had them seated. Have you ever seen him do this? No. He had him, he had him seated by the piano so that he could look at that person. And he decided he would, he would improvise the vibe of that person right then and there. He would actually play the person's character and there would be music. And music. <laughs> And uh, the first, and, and he, uh, being as expert, that's an understatement, but oh. as, as expert he, he, as he is, he's pianistically, he's so, he's so technically adept that, you know, yeah, he, can, he, he can do all that and throw it away, put it aside, yes, and yes. look into the soul of that person yes. and let his hands ex express. Oh. And, but what was so incredible was that, so there was one uh, kind of nicely put together young woman kind of really together, well-dressed, pretty, hair was perfectly done, and she's kind of cool, and kind of had it together, and he sat down and started to play this frenetic piece of music. And, and we're all going, wait a minute. You know, what he's, he, I, I thought, oh my God, maybe he's missing it, and he's missing her. She starts to smile, and the smile gets bigger and bigger. He is exactly duplicating what is going on with her right there, wow. beneath all of that cool and put together. Oh, he my just got, word. And he played it for us. Oh, and he my did it word. For, uh, he did it for others, too. And, oh, uh, my word. That's fantastic. Yeah, but that was, yeah, to me, was, that... He was, he was really a guru. I mean, he was a master soul. He was yes. deeply a master soul and had been for yeah. a really long time, probably his whole life. Mm -hmm. But but he really was a master soul. Yeah. That's right. And master soul is beautifully said because he was a deeply good good man. And, yes. Uh, and so you're and so are, are you still in touch with Gail? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Send her she's, my love. She's will okay. You? We saw we saw her. Yeah, I will. Thank Please. you. I will. Mm -hmm. um, she's does and of course in, in pure poetic style, he, he won his twenty fourth and twenty fifth Grammy posthumously and she accepted for him yes and that was yes. quite something yeah. yeah but that's but I was saying that's an example of being in the moment that's why I brought it up and can't you can't exemplify that like as much as that but that's what we go for it's like Tony Bennett singing I left my heart in San Francisco 5,872 times right well well that's that's the difference because I, I was about to say and forgive me for interrupting you no, imp imp the nature of improvising is absolutely being in the moment, of course, by definition. Right. Yes. But to actually tell the story as if it's the first time with something you've been singing for 5,000 times, yeah. that's another kind of magic. That's it. That's, what you, that's right. My friend, uh, you have some new albums out that you've, you've done. Uh, well, you did uh, 25 years after you did the tribute album tribute. for the, the, the ladies that inspired you. Then you did an album called Fellas. Right, the Fellas, for, for the Fellas was the completion of the idea that started with Tribute. I couldn't right. find a record company to invest in the Fellas. <laughs> and so because of my connection as an artist in residence at Citrus College, which is a, a community college that has a smoking music department, um, the, the dean of that department asked if there was something I could think of that would use their student big band, and that was the fellas. It, the student big mm. band is made up of students and alums and professors, and mm. it is it is really old fashioned uh, apprenticeship and journeyman teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, these these students sit between between these giant musicians and are lifted to great expectations, and boy, do they deliver! Yeah, boy, I they are. You're right. They're smoking yeah. hot. They yeah. are really great. Yeah. And you're an artist in residence there at Citric College? How, yeah, how does I, that work? What, do you come in and do uh, lessons or what do you do? No, the thing is with Citrus, they, because I, they have a beautiful recording studio uh, and they have a great uh, student de music department, when mm -hmm. I bring the kids in, like on the video Just You and I, that is the the pop singers from Citrus College, when I use them, they are given credit for real life performance. Wow, great. 
So it's it's a win win for everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. We yeah. When I'm when I'm recording, they bring in the engineering students to watch. Uh, you know. So yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, you've made some mm -hmm. beautiful records with them. My God. Thank you. The, uh, Thanks. That one, I love the album you made uh, uh, recently. Uh, when I when I played with you in, uh, I guess it was in the Philippines. Uh -huh. uh, we've done we did that and we did the uh, recently the uh, Australia. We did Sydney. Uh -huh. But yeah. in the Philippines, you you played some things on stage from uh, you love you got to love the life. Yes. Which is a great album. Thank That's you. That's a great album. Do they Thanks. play on that album? Those kids play on that album. And the the staff? the, uh, the kids did not. Play on the album, but again, they were watching the late Algero come in and do what he does. They'd never seen that before. They'd never seen music being made as a collaborative effort. Um, so, so, and, and the recording students were watching us do this live. And um, mm. you know, Stevie Wonder came in and played the harmonica, and it was just, it was just spectacular. It was really spectacular for them. And certainly for me as well. Yeah, you've got to. It, it, the listeners, viewers have to have to hear this album. It's Thanks. extraordinary. And and Al Jarreau and Stevie, as you know, Al Jarreau does a track on, on it called uh, called Big Big Light. Yes, and right. Dion Warwick. Sang, yeah, and Dion sang with me. Uh, I had set the very last lyric written by Hal David to music, oh. and Dion sang a duet with me for that. So. It was oh great. my gosh. Yeah. How gorgeous! How gorgeous! Yeah. Well, my friend, uh, I want to ask you a couple more questions, if it's all sure. right, because I'm, sure. I'm having so much fun. Recently, you did a video of a song that you've written. Uh, it was a Hanukkah song. Uh huh. It's called "Let There Be More Light," and uh -huh. it's it is gorgeous. I mean, being a New York Jew myself, uh, uh -huh. there aren't many Hanukkah songs. Right. There's three: <laughs> "Festival of Joy," "Happy Day," "A Jolly Day," and "Dreidel, Dreidel, Dreidel," and that's the same one. I, is there another? No, yeah, yeah, the Adam Sandler one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but not a kind of real song. No. But this is a real song, and this is gorgeous. And uh, thank you. And the the video is beautiful. And uh, used, And how did how does your Judaism uh, and that beautiful ancient music affect you? How's it how has it affected you as a musician and as a person? Well, uh, that's such an interesting question. I, I, I was raised in a loosely Jewish household, although my mother uh, lit the, the Shabbos candles every Friday night, but she did not insist that my sister and I stand with her and learn the prayers. My father was an atheist. Um, <laughs> because God has a sense of humor, we lived right next to a temple. And so for the high holidays, the, those bi big windows were open and my big windows were open. And so we laid in bed and listened to the service. Um, I think I don't really know how to answer it. I mean, I am, I'm, I, I'm Jewish in my soul uh, and uh, I appreciate the, the composers who have, who have been Jewish. I have learned from them. Um, I've learned from Cole Porter as well. Um, I feel that but he's, Jesus, but he's basically Jewish. So there you exactly. Go. You know, the, uh, there is much to learn from Jesus in his in his Judaic upper, you know, upbringing. Um, yep. I, 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 but w but in terms of let there be more light, I really I really wanted to have a Jew, uh, a Hanukkahic, if that's a word, response to Feliz Navidad. Ah. And so I studied that song. How many times Jose Feliciano repeated it? Mm -hmm. What the what the bar count of it was, and the the inspiration for the song. Uh, this was in about 2008. There was a terrible bombing in Mumbai of a of a Chabad house, sure. and it it shook me to the core. And I was living up in, I was living quite a bit away from here. And I needed to find not that I'm a member of a temple, but I needed to find a temple and just sit quietly. And I finally did. And as it turned out, the young rabbi was best friends with this rabbi and his wife who were murdered in India. Yeah. And he said to the congregation, because we were all shook, he said, what is God's response to this darkness? What should be our response to this darkness? More darkness? No, more light. We have to hit this more darkness with more light. And I came home and the song came through me. Let there oh, be more light. 
And so it's very simple. It's very repetitive. And I'm, I'm delighted that the Los Angeles Jewish Symphony, some of their players and some of their choir uh, sang on the video with me. It was lovely. Mm. It's beautiful. It's, it's uplifting Thanks. as you are. Before we end off, um, I want to urge everyone to buy these incredible recordings that she's, Melissa's just done called Review. Yes. It's an, it's an album of her hits and the things that she holds most dear of her own composition. What was that like for you to revisit these songs? Uh, it, it's been lovely. Uh, what, what's interesting is that Review, because of the pandemic, I have been gently and slowly releasing one a month. I started in September, last September, with a video, and also you can find it on iTunes and YouTube and all of the platforms. Um, it was, it was uh, several parts. Uh, because all of these original tracks, these original masters were owned by the record companies, the only way for me to amortize them, like many of my colleagues are doing, is to go back into the studio, re-record them basically as is with a few harmonic tweaks, Mm -hmm. And then and then create a video to go with them. Uh, so we record the first one that we released was Just You and I. Then we did uh, Midnight Blue. Then we did Don't Cry Out Loud. And we're about to release another one. Um, and and uh, what, what, what is interesting is that none of these re-recordings will have fades. They all end because that's the best way to end a song. <laughs> when it's over. <laughs> it, it's over. Go right. about your business. Uh, that's so funny. That, as yeah, long as it so, doesn't end with that, 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 wow. Right, no. Then you're okay. No, no, no. I mean, that's what you do on stage, and that seems most satisfying to me. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. so that's been lovely. And that's, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And when it is all done, and I have released all 10 or 12 songs, then we will, you know, then there will be a package to look at and to buy, if you wish. But, uh, oh, I but see. That's what, so it's that's one what at a time. Yeah, that's what review has been all about. It's just releasing oh. one at a time, because you know I I felt I better reframe this peculiar time that we're all in as some kind of a gift, and mm -hmm. because we're not in a rush and venues are mostly closed, let me just take the time to release it. You know, get some uh, get some fan base and hope people enjoy it. Lovely. Well, they're going to. Uh, listening to just you and I, you've got that. Beautiful choir on there. Thank you. That's, that's those gorgeous. citrus kids. Thank you. Thanks. Is that who they yeah. are? Oh, just yes. Fantastic. Those those are the citrus students. Yes. I wanted that to pay homage to our our frontline workers, but I also wanted it to to remind people that as a nation we can do such good when we're all together. Mm hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, that is how we survive, and we will survive. That's right. Right, my friend. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you so very much. Thank you, this honey. Has been awesome and gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to more music and mischief from you. You in bet. In the future. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, my friend. This is Melissa Manchester. Uh, what a joy to have her here. And that uh, wraps up another episode of Song Sessions. Be with us next time. We'll be spending quality time with another master songwriter. Until then. For all my fellow artists who stay up late burning the midnight or mid-morning oil, as the case may be, keep making beautiful things for us. Lord knows this world needs you now more than ever. Bye-bye for now. I'm David Pomerantz, and we'll see you next time on Song Sessions. Bye-bye.